Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. Somebody said, he did not realize? Did not realize. Say it loud. He did not realize, did not realize. the Lord had left him. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you speak to our hearts, that you bring conviction. I cannot convince anybody. I pray you bring conviction through the Holy Spirit and your word in the name of Jesus. Everybody says, turn around and tell your neighbor, God's going to speak to you today. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. You may be seated, church. I want to speak to you on the importance of character this morning. The importance of character. Character is missing today. A lot of people have a lot of money. People have good looks. A lot of education. A lot of learning. You know. A lot of properties. A lot of stuff. They're full of stuff. But they have no character. One of the things that pleases God the most is a person with character. Hallelujah. And in this life, if you have no character, actually no matter, no matter what you are, no matter what you have, you have a poor ethics, you have a loose spirit, a hateful demeanor, a hateful attitude, just no character. God is a God of awesome characteristics. One of God's greatest characteristics is his love and his faithfulness for us. Hallelujah. His peace, his compassion, his patience. Hallelujah. All these are the characteristics of a mighty God and he expects us as his children to walk as someone with character. So we learn from the life of Samson a tremendous lesson today. It's an old story. It happened a long time ago, but it was real. This is not fiction. Somebody made this up. This is what the Word of God says it was. This is how it happened. Samson was a ruler in Israel for 20 years. The Bible says in Judges 13 that he began his career in a mighty awesome way. An angel came and announced to his parents that were sterile. They couldn't have children. And an angel came and prophesied over them. And they miraculously had a son. And that son became a judge in Israel. You know, it doesn't mean what it means today, a judge. It means he was a chief. He was a leader of the tribes of Israel. And even though Samson had many enemies throughout his lifetime... His worst enemy was himself. Sometimes our worst enemy is not our neighbor, is not nobody else. Sometimes our worst enemy is our own self. Can you say amen, church? This guy had everything going for him. Supernatural strength, good looks, a relationship with God. Yet in spite of all that, he was his own worst enemy. He wasted his life. He brought all kinds of troubles on himself. And sadly, because of our human nature, and our human nature is universal, we today can fall into the same kind of traps as Samson did. And many Christians have fallen into these traps. Samson made a mess of his life because he made three fatal mistakes. He didn't learn from his mistakes. You know, this morning, as we learn from them, we can keep out of trouble. If we can identify these traps, we can work out the problems we're in right now today. We can avoid some problems in the future. We can grow in our character with God. How many want to grow in Christ? Come on, somebody. That's what we're here for. Tell somebody, I don't want to go. Say, I don't want to go through a trial. I want to grow through the trial. Hallelujah. Amen. You know me. As for through the years as your pastor, I've always tried to give you keys. You know, certain precepts and certain things that God gives me. Keys on how to succeed. We just taught that on Wednesday. On how to prosper. On how to excel. And some of the three keys I'm about to give you will help you tremendously in your walk with God. To build your character. The main key word this morning I want to use is learn. Somebody say learn. I need to learn. Hallelujah. Jesus, the Bible says, learned obedience. Through the things that he suffered. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. Those are things that you learn. They don't come automatically. You learn these things. 
And so the first key I want to give you to learn is to learn from our mistakes. Tell your neighbor, on me, you got to learn from your mistakes. Oh, that was sad. Tell him again, you got to learn from your mistakes. He didn't even hear you. Yeah. You see, we are asking for trouble if we refuse to learn from your mistakes. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. If you always do what you've always done, you will always have what you've always had. Samson had two big weaknesses in his life. He never learned to control either one of them. Many of us have that same thing today. All of his life, these things plagued him. And they caused this downfall. The first weakness was a bad temper. Hello? Come on. A bad temper. He got angry all the time. He blew up all the time. And the main motive for his actions was revenge. Samson killed 30 men to get their clothes because he burned with anger. He set a field on fire just to get even in 15.3 of Judges. In verse 7 of chapter 15, he said to a group of men he didn't like, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. And on and on in verse 11, he said, I merely did to them what they did to me. He was vengeful. He was very vengeful. And that's many Christians today. Some of y'all are still vengeful. God has to deal with your temper. He killed another thousand men just to spite. He was never able to control his temper. The other weakness was uncontrolled physical passions. Uncontrolled desires. You see, whatever you don't control, whatever you don't conquer, will eventually conquer you. The Bible says, to whom you give your members over to, you become a slave of. You're a slave of that. He had uncontrolled physical desires. He was physically strong. Supernatural. You know the story of Samson. But he was tremendously morally weak. Something like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hmm? Mr. America. But God calls him Mr. Fool. Physically strong. But morally weak. He ignored God's principles. His life was a pathetic cycle of failures. We can learn from him. He never learned anything. He kept making the same dumb mistakes over and over. Like many people today. You keep backsliding. You keep falling back. The Bible says the dog goes back to his vomit. And the pig goes back to the mud. Just keep on doing the same dumb thing all over and over again. Pastor, I fail. I feel like slapping you sometimes. Like the brother that said to me, Pastor, I just real in, in, in Oxnard, California. One of our leaders said to me, Pastor, I can't tithe because if I tithe, my wife will slap me. I said, if you don't, I'm going to slap you. And I slap harder. <laughs> Just keep making the same dumb mistake. Just keep, keep going over the same, same failures. It was really a, a game. How close can I get to the fire and not get burned? That's the trouble with many people today. How close can I get to sin? And not go to hell. Samson played games with Delilah. A Philistine prostitute. She kept asking the source of his strength. He kept getting teased by, Satan, by Samson every time. But she got a little closer to the truth. He was playing with fire. He toyed with her. And he soon got burned. You see we, say, we tend to do the same thing sometimes. We, we say things like. Just one more time, you know, just this one time, <coughs> even though we feel conviction and guilty, you know, what's it going to hurt? Just one, one more drag, one more drink. <coughs> oh, my God. So we toy with sin. We play with it. We toy with stuff. What's one time going to hurt? Just this one time. I'm going to try this or that. <clears throat> See, none of us plans to be a failure. No one plans to fail. We just fail to plan. No one, no one plans to be a failure. 
It comes on naturally. It comes, you don't just backslide sus all of a sudden. You backslide gradually. Day and week after week. You start straying off from God. It's a process. Little by little. <coughs> Satan weakens you. Your morals begin to decay. Your standards begin to lower. You become far from God. Our whole lives do not fall apart in one day. The problem builds up over a period of time. Because we refuse to learn from your mistakes. How many say I want to learn from my mistakes? <clears throat> this morning you will be saying, but pastor, there's some areas I, I still can't stop smoking. I still have a tough time, you know, with, with alcohol, with light beer, Bud Light. You know, I still have a hard time with cussing. You know, my temper, pastor, I, I still say those four little words, and I'm not, not talking about work or love. I'm defeated in this area over and over. It's tough, Pastor. I just can't do it. I don't know how to overcome, but I got good news for you. God can give you the strength to overcome. Come on. God can give you the power to break the cycle of failure. Hallelujah. You see, Samson had to face the facts. When he faced them, God finally broke his failure. He gave him the power to do what he should do. God will do that for you when you face the facts and you quit hiding the facts and playing, playing games with yourself and excusing yourself and, and blaming everybody else for it. Well, I'm like this because my grandma was this, my father was. No, you're not. You're like that because you want to, homie. No, got nothing to do with your grandma. It's my grandma's DNA. You don't have your grandma's DNA. No, you have the Lord's DNA. You have a new nature. Come on, hallelujah. The next one was learn to choose your friends. What was the first one? Learn to choose your friends. Wow, man. Sometimes we just pick any friend on Facebook. We just friend everybody out there. You don't even know who that person is. I know people that, they got this new junk now, the farmers, uh, lovers.com. What is it? This old Hicks falling in love. Christian mingles and all that kind of stuff. Someone said, if you want to soar with eagles, you can't run with turkeys. You will have to become like the people. You will eventually become like the people you spend the most time with. It's important to choose your friends wisely. Samson got defeated because if you read the story of Samson, he hung around some very stupid homeboys. He, he hung around with a whole bunch of losers. Bad associations. God has chosen Samson for a special job. Samson was a special person chosen by God for a special mission. But because he developed unhealthy relationships, he hung around with the wrong people. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, evil communications corrupt good morals. That's your character. Eventually, when you hang around these kind of people, if you hang around with losers, you can never be wise. If you sleep with a dog, you're going to get full of fleas. That's all. It, it, that's the truth. Come on, some hallelujah. If you want to soar with the eagles, you can't hang around chickens. You want to roar like a lion, you can't hang around a chicken. Come on, hallelujah. You got to choose the people. God has a special purpose for you. God called you out of this world of darkness. God has a special job for you to do. Hallelujah. And you can't hang around with immoral people. Come on, somebody. <coughs> we get ourselves in trouble when we choose the wrong friends. What kind of friends do you have this morning? Does he keep you from coming to church? Is your friend 100% <clears throat> walking with God. Do you have to conform yourself to your friends to please them? Proverbs warns us over and over again about negative associations. Constant exposure to wrong attitudes. Constant exposure to wrong values will take its toll on your life. It's always easier to pull someone down than it is to lift them up. 
It's easier to, for someone to pull you down than somebody else to. It is hard for a pastor to build, to pull somebody up that's been pulled down so low. It's harder. Don't allow yourself to be pulled down by nobody because then it's hard to pick you back up. You can't get up that easy. Somebody that drags you down. You girls. Single girls. Be careful with that dog out there. Uh-huh. When they tell you, if you love me, tell them, go to hell. Be touching this body of the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh-huh. No ringy, no thingy. What kind of friends that I have, Pastor? The kind who bring out the best in you, not the beast in you. The kind that bring out the best in you, man. <clears throat> the kind that lift you up, who encourage you. The kind that make you a better person. A kind that encourage you to serve God and love God and fear God. Come on, hallelujah. That's the kind of friend you got to have. Number three, I like this one. What was number two? Learn to take God serious. Learn to take your ministry serious. I'm going to clamp down on some ministries here because you're not taking your ministry serious. I take this ministry serious. I take what I do for God very serious. There's no joke about what I do, man. When I went to Vietnam, I was serious when I got to Vietnam. I was not joking on food. I didn't ever smoke no pot in Nam. I never got loaded, never got messed up because I wanted to have all my full mind when I was in battle. I didn't mess around with drugs out there, 1968 and 69. Drugs didn't come in heavy until 1971 through 75. I was gone by then. In 1968 and 69, it was a Tet Offensive. That was the Holy War. They were all out to win it. Thousands died in 68. My brother died in 68. Many of my friends died there. We took things serious. You got to take your walk with God serious. Wow. You're asking for trouble when you refuse to take your ministry, your salvation. When you refuse to take the death on the cross that Christ died and hung on the cross for six hours for you. When you refuse to take that serious. When it becomes a joke, you just wear a, a cross around your neck and it means nothing. We have a cross on your wall with Jesus still hanging on it. Why is he still hanging there? Let him go. You don't need no Jesus hanging on a cross in your wall. Why don't you have him in your heart? Come on, hallelujah. Oh, that offends me, Pastor. Breathe my brown lips. I don't care. Samson was careless about his spiritual walk with God. He was careless about the things of God. He was careless about God's love for him. He was careless about his calling. You can't be careless today. When God called you, the Bible says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a people called by God. Come on, somebody. You are God's power. You are God people. You can't become careless, man. He never really got serious with God. It showed more than once. You know, people can see when you're not serious. Did you know the devil can see when you're not serious? The devil knows when you're playing your little games and you come to church, you cry your little crocodile tears up here. Then you go back home, you just live the same old crap. He knows, oh yeah, that's right, I said on the, on the video. See, Samson was always doing his own thing. He lived for himself. He lived a very selfish lifestyle. He let his personal desires dictate his actions. He lived by the world philosophy that many Christians live by today. If it feels good, do it. God's plan for Samson, man, was greatness. God had great plans for this man. He chose especially to destroy that Philistine army. He had great plans for him, just like God has great plans for you. We are headed somewhere. We're going somewhere. We're going to do great things for God. God has plans for you and I. you got to take him serious. Wow. God has a purpose for your life. You're not placed here by accident. 
Well, you know, Bobby was planned for and so was Susie, but I was an accident. No, you weren't. God has no accidents. You'll never hear God say, oops, my bad. Ah, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Samson lived to please himself. Samson, Samson's pattern was carelessness. He took things for granted. Like many people today, they never have really gotten serious. You know what the result was? Uselessness in his life. 20 years as a judge, he never restrained the Philistines. In the end, they did him in. Wow. Another thing, another sign that Samson refused to take God serious is that from all appearances, he never prayed for anything. If you read the story of Samson and Judges, you'll find out Samson was a player, not a prayer warrior. Many Christians still want to be players. You want to goof around and play with the things of God. He never prayed about nothing. He just moved, you know, like an animal. Instincts. The Bible says uh, a carnal man. In Spanish it says, el hombre animal. Never understands the things of God. He moved by instincts. He never prayed about nothing. Except in his final moments. That's the only time you know that he was, he was impulsive. He was impetuous. He never did ask God for direction. He just went on and did whatever he felt like doing. Like so many people today. You don't pray about what you're doing. You don't pray about that relationship you're forming. You don't pray about the situation in your life. You don't pray about the plans that you have in your heart. There's no prayer in your life when you get up in the morning. You just get up and rush and you're late and, and the car won't start and four letter words start coming out and everything mad at everybody. You don't pray in the morning. You don't seek the face of God. You just go get, go get any job because that's what, you know, it's, it's out there right now. That's all it was out. No, you never prayed about it. You never prayed about that situation. You need time, time to pray. We will save ourselves a lot of trouble, a lot of problems, and spare ourselves a lot of pain if we just stop today and ask God for direction, for God's anointing, for God's guidance. Come on, hallelujah. For God's favor. Before we jump into something and get all messed up. I know people right now that are married to someone they don't even love, man. They don't even like that person. They don't even like each other, much less love each other. Huh? I'm, I'm sorry, Pastor, but we're incompatible. Too late, homeboy. When you're all hot and bothered, I, I want to get married. You didn't pray about it. You didn't seek the Lord. You didn't ask for guidance. Wow. You see, we get Satan, I mean, Samson turned to God only when he got into a jam. Sound like somebody here. He turned to God only when he was in trouble. That's what we call foxhole Christianity. We're in a foxhole. Oh God, if you just get me out of this mess, Lord, I promise I will live for you forever. God, if you get me out of this mess, you know, you know you're driving without insurance or cops behind you. Oh Lord, if you just let the police pass, oh Shando, hallelujah, kill a mosquito, hallelujah. You start speaking in tongues, Shando, kill a mosquito, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I'll never do this again God please I promise Lord if, you, if, if my mom doesn't find out please Lord uh, no que no pistolita all of a sudden you're praying now oh God I don't I want to be unpregnant can you make me unpregnant it's too late hello everybody goes oh, yeah. no aquí también he said, to many people today, God is just an afterthought, man. To many people, God is a convenience, a little, a little, uh, what do you call it? A little, uh, like a wand, genie. A little genie in a bottle. When things get tough and tight, they turn to God in desperation. When everything's all right, they ignore God. You see, taking God serious means paying attention to what God says. 
seeking his guidance, not being a hearer of the word, but doing, doing the word of God, obeying the word of God, loving God, serving God, pleasing God. Hallelujah. It's going to take work. It's going to be tough to do that. It's going to take dedication, man. Pleasing God. Taking God serious means being there on time. To see, if some people are never on time. We can never use you in church. That's why you become useless. We can't use you. Because you're never here on time. You become useless in God's sight. You haven't taken God serious, homie. You haven't really realized that this is a serious walk with God. God don't play games. When he calls you, he's not playing a game. His death on the cross was not a game. It was real. God don't play. Say, God don't play games. Samson ne never got serious about living for God until the end of his life. After everything had fallen apart, after he was captured by the Philistines, they gouged out his eyes. They made him grind at grain at the mill. They gave him a job that belonged to an animal. They made an animal out of him. The world will take you and blind you and bind you up and make an animal out of you. He'll degrade you. The world will degrade you. Samson was degraded. The mighty warrior of God was now done in a pit Grinding grain like a burro, walking around blind and no more sight. Wow. When he was in trouble, he finally prayed. Chapter 16, verse 28. I wonder what kind of history Samson would have had if he had prayed from the start. I wonder what kind of life he would have had. Why did he have to wait like many of us until everything falls apart? Why do you got to wait until everything's messed up and then you run to God? You see, Samson's prayerless life, the result, he lost his potential. He lost vision. He was discredited. He lost his freedom. They bound him. He became a slave. Whatever your body gives itself to, whatever you give yourself over to, you become a slave of that. People are slaves to nicotine today, to alcohol, to sex. You become a slave to it. Can't seem to set yourself free from it. Whatever you give yourself over to, you become a slave to. He became a slave to the people he had been sent to conquer. The conqueror now became the conquered. How many men and women of God have I seen like that? That were once pastors and preachers and powerful men, evangelists and missionaries for God. Apostles and preachers and, and prophets are now enslaved. Samson reaped what he sowed. This would be a tragic story had God not been merciful. You know why they blinded Satan? I mean, Samson, I keep saying that. You know why they blinded? You know why they took out his eyes? They took his eyes out and they shaved his head. They shaved because the strength was not in his hair. As long as he did not shave his hair, his head, God said to him, he was a Levite. And as long as he kept his hair, he would become strong. But you know why they shaved it? Because they wanted to break covenant with God. The strength was not in his long hair. The strength was in obedience to God. Your strength is not in you. Your strength is not in things. Your strength is in obedience to God. Obedience is better than all your sacrifices. Come on, hallelujah. Our obedience will make us strong in God. It's not easy to obey. We're never taught to obey. The first thing we, as a baby, the first word we learn is no. Because we're just naturally disobedient. You never hear a parent go, yes, yes. No. The first word the Chris little Mexicanito babies learn is no and Kmart. <laughs> Amen? Cheap, cheap. 
You see, Satan, God, I mean, ay, ay, ay. Samson got his eyes gouged out because the enemy took his vision. The first thing they did was take his vision. And once they took his vision, they shaved his head, which broke covenant with God. And he became a mere man without God anymore. Satan will steal your vision. You can't see the way things God sees them anymore. You, you won't be able to see things the way God sees them or, or God's love. You, you lose vision. Many men of God have gone astray because after a while they lost. How many pastors I know today that are no longer pastoring, defeated, cl churches closed down because somewhere along the line, Satan blinded that man and he lost his vision. Come on, hallelujah. No vision. Without a vision, my people perish, the word of God says. The saddest thing in life is not to be blind. Being blind is sad. You live in darkness. You never know if it's day, day or night, so you sleep all the time. You live in fear when you're in darkness. But that's not the saddest thing. The saddest thing in life is to have sight and no vision. Say, Samson had no vision anymore. He couldn't see anymore. He didn't know where he was going. When you don't know where you're going, any road can take you there. When you don't, know, you don't know where you're going, you'll never know when you got there. He was dark in darkness. They took his vision. Satan will take your vision. Listen to me, mama. God gave you a vision for your family. Dad, God gave you a vision for your family. When Satan steals your vision, your family has no more direction. He enslaves you now. He jives you. He enslaves you. He keeps you in torment and in fear. And he binds you. And he makes you work for him now. He was God's man. I love the way this story ends. Wow. You see, Samson's hair was an outward symbol. It was not the source of his strength. It was the sign of his strength. So when they shaved him. And you know why they did that to him? Let me, let me tell you something. Get this if you get anything. You know why they did that to, to Samson? You know why they got him and they gouged his eyes and they shaved his head? I'll tell you why they did that, Brother Fernando. Because they knew he was never serious with God. They knew he was just a clown. They knew his covenant with God was not real. They could do to him whatever they wanted to do because he had no real, he wasn't for real. He wasn't real. You see, the enemy knows when you're jiving. Oh, pastor, I'm having such a hard time right now. Yeah, because the enemy knows you're jiving. He can do to you what he wants to. They knew Samson. Did you know when you go to prison, when people go to prison, the first thing some of these bad dudes want to do is go to church. Am I right, mijo? They find church real quick, huh? Why? Because you're protected by the church. The brothers are bad in prison. They'll take care of you, man. As long as you go to church and you become a Christian, you carry a Bible, they'll stay away from you. You know what? But don't ever fall because we're watching you. Just because you carry a Bible, you don't fool us, homie. We're watching you. The minute you fall, the minute you messed up, we're on you. We don't care about your Bible. You see, that's what many Christians do. They run to church. They run to the house of God to get protection from them. But you're not really real. You're not really here. You're not here to help. You're not here to in ministry. You're never here on time. You never, you never do nothing in the house of God because you're not for real. And your family is falling apart. He's destroying your home. He's destroying your family, your marriage. He's destroying, taking everything from you. Why? Because he can do it. Because he, you're not real. You see, you're not real. Did you know a lot of Christians have still albums from Freddie Fender and all of, a bunch of crap from uh, the world, Vicente Fernandez and all of, you, you still have old stuff from the world, old albums from the world. Did you know what happens? You know what happens? Like, let me, let me explain that to you real quick. You know when you have a bad relationship, you never marry that guy, but that guy lives with you and you shack up and you have kids with that guy and, and after a while the, the relationship doesn't work and you kick him out, you, you get out, hit the road, Jack. 
and you kick that dude out of your house, but that dude can always come back. Why? Because you got his kids. You had kids together. And he uses that excuse to come and see his kids. So you have all kinds of trouble for the rest of your life. You see, as long as you have Satan's babies, he can always come back and visit you. And not even God can help you. Are you hearing me? You got this demonic video games in your homes. You got this demonic movies, pornography movies, and all that crap in your house. Huh? You got some stuff in your home that doesn't belong to God. It belongs to Satan. But you use that in the world. That was to remind you of the world. Some old pictures. Of when You look like a hoochie mama. Oh, look at that girl. Huh? Some of us guys with a shirt open here with three little hairs on your chest. Give it up. They're all great. Got the owls already. Huh? You got stuff in your house that doesn't belong to God. It belongs to Satan. So Satan can always come back and visit you because you got, he's the, he's the baby daddy. Hello? So see, mija, the Philistines knew this guy was playing games. They knew he was never real. So he became a slave. He became an animal. You will become a slave and you will become an animal if you play around with the things of God. And you don't take God's things serious. No one, no one takes you serious. Oh, the church. I don't know. There's no love in the church. No, but no, 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 no. They know you're just a mess up. And they know you're not serious. There comes a time. You know, the Bible says, Samson did not know. Samson did not know the spirit of God had left him. Remember that scripture? He, he thought he could just get right back up like many people did. You think you just come to church and just speak in tongues right here and, and shoot off your mouth and expect God to just move on your behalf. You can do whatever you want to because you do not know that the Spirit of God has left you. A lot of people, you see, I, as, as in the world, I'm ashamed of what I'm about to tell you. But in the world, I od twice. I overdosed twice. I was going to die twice. They, they dropped me off in the hospital. They dumped me off in the hospital. Thank God they dropped me off in the hospital. They threw me in the hospital there in the sidewalk. And they took my car. Some ambulance guys had parked and they saw me and they picked me up and they put me in a, in a, in a gurney and they shoved me in the hospital and they woke me back up. I was dying. I didn't know I was dying. All I wanted to do was sleep. I was dying. I was dying. I had OD'd and I didn't know I was dying. But they, they woke me back up and they said, you were dying. You were seconds away from death. I didn't know that. All I wanted to do was sleep. And that's what's wrong with many Christians today. You're dying. You're dying. You've overdosed with this world and you're dying. And you don't know that you're dying. And you need somebody to wake you up. And this morning, God's trying to wake you up. Wow. He was never serious. Oh, let, let me end it with this scripture, though. Let me finish with this. Judges 16, 22. The hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Tell somebody, his hair began to grow just like pastors. Hmm? Come on, finish it. It's by faith anyway. You're going to see when you get to heaven, you're going to see me go. And you're going to say, oh, look at that show off pastor. You know what this means? I like this, Brother Lázaro. Y el pelo de Samson empezó a crecer otra vez. I like that. Otra vez. Somebody say, again. Again. The process of renewal was starting. Samson had repented and began to pray to God. He began to look to God for strength one more time. He was sorry for what he had done. And God began to honor his desire. God began to give him his strength back one more time. Come on, somebody. One more time. Somebody say, one more time. God began to look at Samson once more. Hallelujah. Samson had ended his life. Hallelujah. In a 
messed up way, but God had not forgotten Samson. Hallelujah. God remembered Samson. And once again, his hair began to grow because God does not give up on us. Hallelujah. God will always give you a second chance, another start again. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. He was a total failure, man. He was a complete failure. A man given to passions and anger. Playing with the things of God. Never committed to God. But now he prayed to God. And he was placed between two pillars. In a huge building. And the Bible says that he killed everybody inside the temple. Three, more than 3,000 people were, died that day. You see, God has sent Samson to conquer this enemy. In the first place. But Samson had played with God. But now after he repented, God was able to accomplish more in his death than in his life. This is sad. What a powerful life he could have lived. But he did defeat the enemy. When? When God gave him a second chance. Somebody say a second chance. God give me a second chance. Give me another chance. Give me another, another chance, God. Give me, give me another opportunity. Samson's hair began to grow. Oh, God had remembered Samson. Even though Samson had played games with God, God never played games with Samson. Maybe you feel this morning that you've messed up in your life so bad that God can't love you anymore or use you. Remember Samson. Learn from him. God never gave up on him. God will never give up on you. God saw potential in spite of Samson's messed up life. God saw potential. God remembered why he made him. God remembered why he called him. And God remembers you today. God, you are valuable to God. God called you. Hallelujah. Out of darkness. You were created for great things. Hallelujah. Only as you move into the center of God's will this morning will you discover why you were made. Uh, will you discover your potential. Will you understand that God is a God of the second chance. Hallelujah. God can lift you up again. God can pick you up from the mud and the crud. Hallelujah. And make you a man and woman of God. Come on. Hallelujah. God can still restore you. Hallelujah. You will feel fulfilled. You become success in God's sight as you understand and face the fact that you need God. You were created in His image. You are the epitome of His creation. In spite of all His failures. I love this story. How God could take a person who was a total failure in many areas of his life. How God can take a fool like this man and still use him for great things. Oh, I learned one thing in my 38 years of preaching. I learned one thing. If God only used people who were perfect, ain't none of us would be of no good to God. Because this is not a place of perfect people. I still have to put that sign up there one day. I'm going to put a sign. If you're looking for the perfect church, keep going. Hallelujah. Because this is a building full of imperfect people that God is perfecting. Come on, some hallelujah. This is a, a, a place of people that are unfinished that God's still working on. Hallelujah. We're going to put a sign that says, still under construction. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. God, the church of the second chance. Hallelujah. When God gives us a second chance, where God will pick you from the guttermost and raise you to the uttermost because God is God. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Learn from Samson. Learn from this man. God is not looking for extraordinary people to get the job done. He uses ordinary failures. People with imperfections and weaknesses. People who have failed and stumbled and slipped and messed up. That he can pick them up once again. Clean them up. You know my story. You heard my story. But I have to say it one more time. And I'll finish with this. 
When we were little boys, we used to go to the dump with my dad. Back in those days, they let you bring things from the dump. We'd go shopping. I used to look for two by fours, two by fours and spindles, sewing spindles and cut them in half. I would look for pet milk cans and any can that looked chrome, we used to look for little tomato cans. And we'd take them home, a whole bunch of those, and cut them and put the pet milk cans and put a nail through them and paint them real pretty, the boards, and put the little, cut the things and put wheels on them. Then we used to put hooks on the string. We'd paint, maybe put five or six of them and paint them different colors and they look real pretty, shine them up. And the, and the neighborhood kids would buy some from us. And my dad would pass by as we painted them and my dad would say you did a good job son you did a good job you took trash from the dump and you did this you did a good job son well done as I stand preaching here today the father turns to Jesus the son and says to him you did a good job son you did a good job. You found that man in the dump. You found that boy in the trash. And you cleaned him up and he's standing there preaching for me today. You did a good job, son. You did a good job. He did a good job. As I look out at you and I, he did a good job on us. Because God didn't pull us from the, from the heap of the nice pile. He picked most of us from the trash. Remember where he called you from. And he's done a good job. He's done a good job. And he's given you a second chance today. Maybe you wanted ministry and you haven't had it. Maybe you failed. Maybe you messed up. Maybe you slipped. Maybe you never were. Maybe you have never really got serious with God. And this morning you're saying, you know what, Pastor? It touched my heart. And I don't want to fool around no more. I don't want to play no more games no more. I don't care who you are. Grandma, mama, hallelujah, daughter, child, young person. God is speaking to you. Hallelujah. God is serious about it. He's calling about you. Don't play with God. Isaiah chapter 4 says, because you reject God, God will reject you and not only will he reject you he's going to reject your children boy that's heavy when God begins to reject your children Exodus chapter 36 says because he says I will punish the children for their father's sin up to the fourth generation if your children are suffering your children are going through something you better check yourself out God will punish them because of you but today he's giving you a second chance. Today he's giving you a chance. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if people are going to see you well. They might see me. So what? They can't save you. The only one that can save you is Jesus. The only one that can give you a second chance is Jesus. This morning as we stand up and come to this altar. Come on. Hallelujah. You get up and you come quickly to this front. You say, Lord.